Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Chorciari. I'm the director of the Wiser Diplomacy Center here at the University of Michigan, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event on the evolving role of the United States in the Gulf region. Uh, we're pleased to be able to partner in this uh, event with the Gulf International Forum, a leading think tank in Washington, D.C., focused on the Gulf and the surrounding Middle Eastern region. And today we are joined by a stellar panel of experts on the region uh, who are going to discuss some of the main themes happening in and around the Gulf today. We have Dr. Dania uh, Toffer, who is the executive director of Gulf International Forum. She's an expert on the politics and political economy of the Gulf and on U.S. Gulf relations, and is widely published in both of those domains. She's also a professorial lecturer at Georgetown and previously worked at the National Defense University in Washington. We're also privileged to welcome Dr. Abbas Kadim, who leads the Atlantic Council's Iraq Initiative. He's an expert on Iraq uh, and an author of the book, Reclaiming Iraq, the 1920 Revolution and the Founding of the Modern State. He's been a senior foreign policy fellow at Johns Hopkins Dice, uh, a visiting faculty member at Stanford and on the faculty at the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, as well as having served at the Iraqi Embassy in Washington. We're also pleased to welcome General Anthony Zinni, a retired and highly decorated U.S. Marine Corps General. He served as the Special U.S. Envoy to Israel and the Palestinian Authority, in addition to posts in Somalia, Pakistan, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. And he ended his uh, distinguished career as Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Central Command. Last but not least, to moderate today's conversation, we welcome back Ambassador Patrick Theros, former U.S. Ambassador to Qatar, uh, former Deputy Chief of Mission in Jordan, as well as in the United Arab Emirates, former advisor to the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Central Command, and also the longtime President and Executive Director of the U.S. Qatar Business Council. Ambassador Theros is now a strategic, interna uh, strategic advisor to Gulf International Forum. And Ambassador Theros, we're very pleased to see you back uh, at the Ford School and look forward to a great conversation. Ambassador Theros will start off uh, by leading a conversation with the panelists, and soon we will get to your audience questions that you are able to submit via YouTube. So welcome you all to the Ford School community. Uh, and with that, I'll turn over to Ambassador Theros. Dr. Churchari, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, my only big regret is I can't be in Ann Arbor, the town I was born in, uh, but perhaps next year. Uh, we are here today to discuss uh, just how will uh, the dynamics of the American political system change American policy and what happens in the Gulf and how the Gulf states react to us. I would like to begin by asking each of our panelists to address the core question uh, uh, for today. How is the American role in the Gulf changing? And how are the JCC states responding to the election results? General Zinni. Well, I think in terms, uh, I'll take the second part of that first. Uh, knowing the, the region for the past 30 years, I think when they see a change of administration, it's more of a wait and see. Uh, I, I don't think they have any preformed ideas. I do think there might be some concern out there because there was some issues with the Obama administration on how they handled the Arab Spring and Muslim Brotherhood. So I do think they'll look very closely at the foreign policy team as it's put together to see how uh, that's come about. Obviously, uh, things in the Gulf have changed. Uh, we see the changes in Saudi Arabia, uh, the war in Yemen, uh, a number of events that have uh, taken place, Turkey's uh, greater interest in this part of the world, that probably in the last couple of years have, have changed the dynamics out there. Uh, obviously, the war in, in Syria also. So I think it's a time with... Uh, some events that have occurred that have surprised people. I think the recognition of Israel by the UAE and Bahrain obviously would not have been done without Saudi Arabia's okay. Uh, I think sometimes we misinterpret that. I don't believe that was a US orchestrated event. I think the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain knew what they were doing. They were trying to gain leverage over Israel uh, to prevent maybe expansion into the settlements. Uh, and, and also looking to uh, gain 
uh, things from the United States for it, such as uh, advanced arm, arms and uh, weapon systems. So that's kind of a run through very quickly of what might have changed recently and, and how they may be looking at the new administration coming in. Thank you, General. Dr. Kadim, uh, Iraq uh, still figures as one of the uh, two most important and largest countries uh, of all in the region. Uh, just shortly before coming on air today, I saw an announcement that the U.S. military is expecting uh, President Trump to order a withdrawal, partial or, or total, we don't know, uh, of U.S. forces from Iraq and Afghanistan. But in that context, how do you think the uh, the Gulf states view the change in administration in the United States, and what do you think uh, the U.S. will uh, will be doing? Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's an honor to be with this distinguished uh, panel. Um, a couple of things you just mentioned: Iraq. Certainly, Iraq uh, is a, one of the places that the new administration needs to keep an eye on. Uh, Iraq, of course. When we mention Iraq, we also mention Iran. Uh, and uh, it is whatever goes on in inside Iraq right now, mostly is a byproduct of the uh, the, the uh, course of U.S. Uh, European relations. When uh, the two countries uh, are on a negotiation or diplomatic path, things calm down in Iraq. When it is uh, uh, the other way around, uh, we see a, uh, a more uh, ten more tension and a more uh, difficult time. So uh, certainly, I think this uh, piece of news is going to be significant. I don't think the administration intended it that way, but if it happens, then the Biden administration, assuming it will be the Biden administration, will have an easier time in Iraq. Uh, I think uh, the uh, the Gulf. Uh, states and Iraq, as I like to look at it, it's, it is a Gulf state. It has a narrowing but uh, still existing uh, access to the Gulf. Uh, and uh, it is uh, simply, I think, the other uh, Gulf states, the GCC members, do look at the new administration in terms of how the new course of U.S.-Iranian relations are going to, to take. Uh, if the campaign promises uh, uh, from going back to negotiation, probably trying to uh, get another deal with Iran or return to the old deal with some modifications, uh, that would be very important uh, for the Gulf states because they have counted on uh, in, in their rivalry with Iran on the U.S. Uh, government being a, uh, a key player in the region, and it is a key player in the region. Also, looking at uh, the uh, the outcome of the uh, U.S.-Iranian um, policies or, or relations on Iraq, that will mean a lot to the Gulf states. As we all know, the, the Gulf states, at least since 2015-16, especially Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE, began to warm up towards Iraq. Uh, and uh, they are uh, trying to balance the influence they have with the influence the Iranians have. Um, and, and certainly this is uh, very important. Uh, relations are, are, especially with Saudi, are becoming uh, warmer with Iraq in, in a significant way. We hope that uh, uh, the, uh, the region will benefit from uh, a, um, a less tension uh, if we go back to diplomacy. Um, but still, I think uh, we, we have to figure out what the new administration is going to do. I think people who uh, analyzed or uh, predicted what uh, the Biden administration will be on the basis of the past record of uh, Senator or Vice President uh, Biden in, in two eras, I think they are in for some surprises because I don't believe that uh, uh, President-elect Biden will will go back and revisit his old views. So much uh, water went under the bridge uh, since he held them. Dr. Cotton, thank you. I uh, tend to agree that we that the past is not always uh, the future. Uh, the though we I was I will say my view that uh, uh, President Biden, President-elect Biden, uh, is a man of the system, and he's a man who works through the system. 
Uh, uh, Dr. Thoffer, uh, could you sort of tie these all together, and particularly on the American side? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned in our earlier private event, um, I think uh, Washington has been doing some soul searching uh, about its role in the Middle East. Um, and frankly, the uh, American public has, as everyone knows, has grown impatient uh, with conflicts in the Middle East. And uh, the U.S. interests have, have changed and evolved um, in the last decade. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, oil, uh, Middle East oil has become less uh, politically and economically relevant, albeit maintaining the oil supply is still important. Um, terrorism is less of an imminent threat than it once was for the U.S. Um, and I would like to also mention, as General Vinnie mentioned earlier, is that maintaining the free flow of goods and waterways is also important. Um, but really that and the only other uh, lingering major strategic concern is non-proliferation. And um, for the last uh, decade, uh, policymakers have discussed different options, uh, whether it's retrenchment, uh, reduction of forces, or complete uh, withdrawal, which are all centered on um, stepping back from the region. And this discussion has been ongoing since Obama's era. Regardless of the decline in strategic interests, um, uh, I still think that the Gulf remains a linchpin uh, to U.S. Uh, foreign policy in, in the region. Um, and when reviewing the changes in U.S. Uh, priorities as it pertains uh, to the Gulf, um, looking at the, uh, the different uh, strategic documents, whether it's the National Military Strategy or the National Security Strategy and the National Defense Strategy, which all sound very similar, um, what one salient trend that stands out is priorities and resource allocations are are, are changing and have shifted from the perspective of the, from the perspective of the U.S. and the U.S. approach has changed um, over the last decade. Everything points in that direction. So I think overall uh, the messaging from the U.S. side is to promote uh, U.S. Uh, the U.S.'s interests, our interests without indefinite U.S. involvement. Um, so that's a careful balance, balancing act. Basically, a strategy of empowering uh, partner nations um, uh, with the support of the U.S. while maintaining less direct involvement. And I've heard the generals talk about the by, with, and through approach to dealing with the region. Uh, and um, really, what you can see is that the U.S. has maintained uh, its basing infrastructure in the Gulf, and that hasn't changed. Um, the, the, the number of bases has relatively remained the same over the past few years, and these are permanent architectures. The, so the U.S. really has been walking in conclusion, finally I'm getting to my conclusion, has been walking a fine line that has displayed restraint without retrenchment. And um, uh, both Trump and Biden agree on one thing, um, a drawdown of U.S. troops, but there's really no definition of how that will look. And regardless, I think, um, and I strongly believe that the Gulf continues to be the linchpin of US, the U.S. security architecture in the Middle East, no matter what politics they go forward with. Uh, Dr. Daffer, uh, I'm sorry, I lost you. Are you are you finished? Then you think? Yes. No? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Sorry. My apologies for that. Okay. Uh, we are unique as a country in a democratic country where we hold elections uh, in one month and the power transfers to two and a half months later. Uh, in that time, a president remains uh, still president. Uh, he is still has all the authorities of president. I know I remember very well that our first intervention in Somalia uh, happened uh, as uh, Bush uh, Bush 41 was in his transition, and then he took a very uh, major step. So I'd like to ask each of our panelists, beginning with General Zinni, uh, 
any thoughts, ideas, uh, predictions on what will happen uh, in the interim, in the uh, interregnum until January 20th? Well, I, the news today was concerning in that President Trump is uh, indicating he might order the withdrawal of uh, U.S. forces from Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I think that would be a disaster. I think we have to be very careful about how we do things like that. It could encourage uh, the Taliban. It could encourage uh, Iran and, and others to become uh, more adventuresome on some sort, with some sort of precipitous uh, movement. It's also dangerous for our troops themselves and very disruptive with some of the programs we have ongoing with Afghan forces and Iraqi forces. You know, we have training programs, we have uh, equipment and base operations that uh, we work cooperatively with them and uh, have to be maintained. Uh, you know, in the past, I went through the Somalia business, as you mentioned, Patrick, and uh, I, I can tell you that although President Bush made that decision after he had lost the election, there was a lot of work with the Clinton transition team, understanding what he had done and what he was trying to do. Basically, he, he did it for humanitarian reasons. And uh, the, the Clinton administration publicly said they, they accepted that and were willing to take it on. Obviously, here, we don't have that kind of seamless transition, which is necessary in things like this. So I think we have to be very careful with uh, with what we're doing. Uh, you know, our, our military presence out there, as uh, Dania mentioned, uh, is pretty well established. That We actually ra uh, ratcheted up because of the wars out there. But there is a fundamental basic structure out there. Mainly, it's built around headquarters and preposition equipment, training, and that sort of thing. Uh, eventually, you can withdraw combat forces if things and tensions reduce. But I think we'll always have a military presence to solidify our relationship, military to military, uh, out in the region with our allies. Dr. Kadhem, uh Iraq must be particularly concerned, positively or negatively, on the prospect of the withdrawal of American forces. Now, we don't know if uh, he intends to order a complete withdrawal, leave a residual force. He has threatened to close the embassy. So your views on where this could go, Dr. Carter? Well, thank you for this question. Uh, I see the general's comment on uh, the, uh, the, the impact of withdrawal of troops, especially when um, they are needed in both in Iraq and Afghanistan for many purposes. But also, uh, there are other considerations in the case of Iraq, uh, because these troops have become the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, focus of conflict, uh, especially between Iran and uh, the United States. And certainly, Iran is uh, doing this through its own uh, uh, proxies or fighting groups that are loyal uh, to it. Um, and uh, there are three kinds of troops in Iraq that we can really, if we were to dissect this whole situation and nuance it, the troops that are there to um, uh, protect U.S. interests, such as the embassy and other uh, places and uh, consulates, etc. And then there are the troops that are part of the training of Iraqis. Uh, Iraq purchased a lot of weapons from the United States and there are troops that are there for training purposes and also other training of capacity building for Iraqi forces. And then there are the troops that went after uh, June 2014 uh, to fight ISIS. Uh, there is a consensus almost of Iraq that they have no problem with the first two uh, categories, uh, but the third uh, uh, number or, or group of, of US troops that are the point of dispute uh, and I believe uh, the, the situation here is, uh, of course, uh, the, the Iranian and also some Iraqis who objected to their presence is because of the uh, these uh, statements that were made either by President Trump or uh, by other U.S. officials. I think uh, that will not be the case with the upcoming administration. But by all means, uh, the uh, U.S. presence in Iraq, military and civilian, diplomatic, etc., also the aid is huge in Iraq, and it's absolutely vital for, for the Iraq to fight uh, terrorism, to also 
keep uh, on, build on keep capacity. Uh, but also, uh, we have to face it that the presence of U.S. troops is a problematic issue, especially in light of the unanimous vote of the Iraqi Council of Representatives that called on the government to negotiate a withdrawal. So a withdrawal, partial withdrawal of troops uh, will be, I think, a, a good uh, way to uh, meet for both countries on a common ground uh, and diffuse a situation that uh, escalated unnecessarily back in uh, November, December and, and last year and January this year. Um, and and I, I think uh, that uh, we, we remain uh, probably uh, vigilant on how this relation proceeds uh, without uh, uh, losing the potential of uh, what robust bilateral Iraqi-U.S. relations can accomplish for both sides, and especially for Iraq. Iraq actually needs U.S. more than the U.S. needs Iraq, definitely. But uh, still, it is a mutual and, and a, uh, a bilateral interest. Thank you, Dr. Qadab. Uh, Dr. Zafar, we, uh, a lot of us had talked and speculated that one of the things that uh, President Trump might do is begin or accelerate the withdrawal of American forces from the region. That's one shoe that fell. Are there any other shoes that might fall uh, between now and January 20th? You had mentioned earlier something about a uh, some sort of magical solution to the internal Gulf crisis. Yes, well, there are other, uh, other shoes, um, if you will. Uh, well, uh, I'll give a, an overview. So one thing that I'm certain of is that Trump will continue trying to maintain dominance of the news cycle. Um, he's, he's famous for that. And he'll keep insisting that he's the winner of this election. But as for the Gulf um, and the broader Middle East, uh, I think he will work towards uh, solidifying his legacy, which is centered on aggressions with Iran Arab normalizations, uh, Arab normalization with Israel, and the reduction of the military presence in the in the Gulf region. Um, I expect he will unquestionably uh, continue his uh, maximum pressure policy, and he will be bent on making a return to the JCPOA as difficult as possible for the Biden administration. So I would not discount him flooding Iran uh, with more sanctions. Um, a big question that I've heard um, from different people is about whether there will be some sort of war with Iran. I believe going to war would be an affront uh, to Trump's uh, base, who are adamantly opposed to endless wars, and currently his most ardent supporters. Uh, they were here in Washington this weekend. Um, furthermore, uh, there is little uh, legislative support uh, for such an endeavor. Uh, Trump, like as I said, will continue his maximum pressure campaign and probably uh, uh, take credit uh, if a better deal is negotiated uh, by a Biden administration. Um, and, and Iran is also hedging its bets and surely would avoid dragging itself into a war when it has this uh, golden opportunity in its hand to negotiate uh, with the next administration. Um, as for last minute uh, pushes for normalization with Israel, I think that ship uh, ha has sailed, um, I guess for this administration, I suppose any country that intends to normalize relations with Israel will wait it out so they can maximize their returns with the next administration. I have, as you have mentioned, Ambassador Theros, have, have read that um, security advisors of Trump have mentioned that within the next 70 days, they're going to push to solve the Gulf crisis. Um, and they're saying that it's really important uh, for counting Iran, which I think is, is a good point. But also, they said that it would elevate the chances of normalization with, with Israel. So that, that that's a very curious statement and something that we would have to watch for. Um, in reduction, uh, in regards to reduction of um, the US military presence in the Middle East, uh, well, uh, obviously it's plausible and now it's 
even more plausible that um, he, he, he will uh, withdraw some troops as we've read um, in the news um, about Iraq and Afghanistan. But I also wouldn't forget northeastern uh, Syria. And I don't know what he's going to do about the embassy in Iraq, but I think um, Abbas has more, can, can say more about that. Um, I also think that Trump may continue to push uh, for the allocation of favors uh, to the GCC states um, with an eye on future business opportunities once he leaves the office. Um, you know, he has approved the F-35, which we know that's related to normalization. With He tried to push the sale. We'll see what happens with Congress and, and, and moving that a sale forward. Although we know that that's a very uh, confusing quest um, if you're trying to follow the issue. Um, and he also designated Qatar as a non-NATO ally, um, which I think uh, Kuwait and, and Bahrain are, were already considered non-NATO allies. Um, and we saw how he awarded the late uh, Amir, uh, the Legion Merit, that, that special award. So I think these are some examples of Trump kind of um, granting favors to the GCC states. And I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see more of that. And that's it. I, I find it difficult to think of what sort of incentives he could give the UAE to make up with Qatar. Uh, this is uh, not something that is easily uh, bought this way. Uh, <clears throat> transitioning from uh, what's going to happen between now and January 20th to when President Biden walks into the Oval Office, he's going to have a lot of things on his mind on doing uh, executive orders and so forth. But at some point, some really big issues are going to come up that pertain directly to the Gulf. In uh, your view, uh, again, General Zinni, uh, if you prioritize those issues, which one need he address first? Well, I think the, the number one question is going to be, what will the relationship with Iran be? Now, whether that's taken on first or not, uh, that's a different story. But I think everyone's going to be looking to see if there will be an attempt to reinstate the uh, the nuclear uh, deal. Uh, I think that the Biden administration, obviously going back to the Obama administration, realizes that uh, that that can't be a one off. Uh, the reason it got so much criticism and, and in effect, uh, failed in the end was because there was no follow-up on other issues. So I think if they were to re-engage, you're going to see uh, a, a, some sort of condition set that it must lead to something else beside just uh, the, the nuclear aspects of, of the deal. Uh, I think you will see a clamor from the Gulf states saying that that relationship with Iran and the discussions and dialogue have to include them. Uh, I heard a lot of uh, uh, concerns last time that the six plus one did not include them, and they felt as loyal allies who stuck their head above the parapet and faced off against Iran at our insistence uh, were left high and dry with the deal. So uh, there's going to have to be some uh, interest in uh, which way do they play into this. The other thing I would say is um, we have tried mightily to create some sort of coalition formalized coalition in the Gulf. Uh, the latest in the Trump administration was the Middle East Strategic Alliance, MESA. And I think uh, there may be, and that's always been, regardless of whether it's Democrat or Republican administration, that's always been as long as I can remember back 30, 35 years. That's been something we have been trying to do. And I would think that they may try to pursue that again, to look at some sort of relationship, uh, the Mesa had four pillars to it, energy, the economy, diplomacy, and security. Uh, whether they follow up on that, uh, that was a, basically an interagency uh, uh, approach. And whether there'll be interest in the Biden administration to push on that even further. But I think that'll be another priority out there eventually. Dr. Cotton, uh Clearly, uh, Iraq, again, sits at, uh, at the apex of this. It's, uh, it's the keystone to the Gulf, uh, at least physically on a map. Uh, what do you think is going to be the biggest issue facing the president, and how does it uh, impact on the Gulf? 
I believe that uh, the uh, one of the main issues the president will face is his uh, uh, past record and the Iraqis' perceptions of what uh, 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 President Biden would be. Because for Iraqis that we, we talk to every day, um, President Biden's name is associated with his uh, old uh, proposal that uh, there would be uh, a, an excessive um, decentralization in the country. Iraqis call it uh, Biden's uh, plan to divide Iraq. Uh, and uh, that, that would be uh, important, I think, to bring Iraqis to be supportive of, of the government warming up to the, to the U.S. Uh, uh, administration would be one thing. So he needs really to reveal what his current uh, position on uh, Iraq and U.S.-Iraqi relations, whether he will uh, continue this uh, policy of two Iraqs, uh, Baghdad and Erbil, or deal with Iraq as one Iraq. I think this has been one of the bad uh, glitches in U.S.-Iraqi uh, uh, relations and U.S. foreign policy towards Iraq. Uh, that's another thing. I believe that uh, one of the issues that will will be taken, and this is a nonpartisan issue, is the combat of terrorism. Iraq is one of the main two theaters of combating terrorism in the region with Syria. So that would be important. Uh, and also, I believe that uh, there will be uh, the question of uh, how to uh, help Iraqi government uh, balance its relations and obligations, territorial geopolitical obligations in its regional uh, politics. Uh, the Iraqi government, at least since the uh, government of Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi uh, who uh, took over in 2014, tried to maintain a policy of neutrality uh, and uh, it is very hard to be uh, to be neutral in a place where everybody uh, demands that you would be either with them or against them. So one way to balance Iraqi relations is to have really healthy relations with the Gulf, the Arab, Arab side of the Gulf. And also uh, Iran is a reality and they have to have relations that are, again, healthy relations, not relations where Iran has this level of in influence that it maintains now. And the U.S. being a, uh, an enabler of, of this, uh, that, is, that is very important. So, so these are the issues. I don't see Iraq being part of the equation of the normalization uh, or, or, or peace agreements, name them whatever you like, on, uh, with Israel. Um, um, Iraq has made its policy clear that they are part of the long dead uh, Arab initiative that um, King Abdullah once put forward. Israel is never going to take it and the Arabs probably are going to stick by it. And then, you know, so it, it, Iraq in under the current situation of normalization a la Bahrain, UAE or Sudan or some other country would, would not would be the last to sign. It will never sign. Okay. That sounds like a very convincing argument, Dr. Kailan. Dr. Dafer, uh, we've run through uh, two rather difficult uh, decisions uh, uh, facing the new administration. Uh, one of the questions that has always intrigued me is this question of benign neglect. He is going, Dr. Uh, President Biden is going to be swamped. This is going to be an incredibly difficult transition. Uh, will it, uh, uh, do you think that uh, these important decisions will be uh, front and center in his office or will they be delegated to whoever the Secretary of State is or the Assistant Secretary for the region? And what else is there that he might need to address? You're, <laughs> you're muted. I'll mute myself. Um, unfortunately, you know, the U.S. has a lot to deal with at home. And um, so it, it is no coincidence that at the last uh, debate between Trump and Biden, the Middle East wasn't mentioned. If you look at um, the Democrats' uh, platform, it's, it's a long um, report, but, you know, the Middle East is all the way at the bottom. Um, so, the, so, so that is true that uh, priorities have shifted to be more inward focused um, for the U.S. 
Um, as uh, General uh, Zini mentioned, uh, Iran is uh, uh, a key question. Um, and one that actually I, I felt that has, has really been put on the back burner, but is really important um, is Yemen and the Yemen war. And um, uh, Yemen is suffering from an unthinkable humanitarian catastrophe. And Biden has stated that he will end the support for the war. Uh, there's plenty he can do, um, even if he has a Republican uh, majority Senate, um, which is the likely case. Uh, uh, so to take a step back, the US has taken some measures to decrease the support uh, for the Yemen war. Uh, it no, it's no longer fueling Arab coalition jets. Uh, there are no boots on the ground involved in physical acts of war between uh, the Houthis and the Arab coalition and Yemeni forces on the ground. However, there are more options on the table that Biden can carry out and we'll see what he ends up doing. Um, with an issue, issuance of an executive order, Biden could end uh, US intelligence sharing with the Saudi coalition um, and logistical support and uh, spare parts uh, transfers that keep Saudi warplanes in the air. Another option is to have the State Department put a stop on all arms sales to Saudi Arabia, placing certain criteria to allow their sales. Additionally, he can use his leverage as a president uh, of one of the most powerful countries in the world to put pressure on other nations um, supporting the uh, Saudi coalition like France, the United Kingdom, and Canada, um, and get them to follow suit in pushing a drawdown to this war. Biden could also um, restore humanitarian assistance to the northern part of Yemen. Um, so there, there are many options, and he could choose a couple or not the other, but there, there's still a lot that he can do. Um, a curious case is, is to watch what will happen between uh, Biden and Saudi Arabia. Um, I know there's been discussions about uh, a push to punish Saudi Arabia on the the side of the Democrats, and and there is a clear sense of tension there. Um, Saudi Arabia has accrued a basket of hot button issues that has roused Democrats. Uh, you know, the war in Yemen uh, is one. Uh, the Jamal Khashoggi affair is another one. Uh, the Trump's Trump administration. The Trump administration's overt support uh, for Saudi Arabia through all of these affairs is another one. So collectively, all of these factors have made uh, Saudi a partisan affair. Now, do I think Saudi will survive with Biden? Yes. Uh, if history is a sign of how Saudi-U.S. relations work, then I uh, suspect that uh, a Biden administration will find a way to cooperate with Saudi Arabia. And it is noteworthy to mention that Saudi is really an important strategic partner to the U.S. And let's, let's not all discount that. But it will be interesting to see how uh, uh, he deals with, with, with Saudi. Thank you. Uh, we're talking a lot about what, uh, the, what are the decision points for uh, the Biden administration or what will President Trump do. Let's sort of go to the other side of the, of the pond on this one. Uh, how, what actions will the uh, big players in the Gulf themselves take? What would be Iran's strategy uh, with the U.S.? How would Iran position itself to deal with the incoming uh, Biden administra uh, administration? Uh, uh, Dr. Kadim. As... Uh suffered a lot under the um, Trump administration and uh, its, uh, its policy uh, of uh, running the clock uh, worked. Um, they were hoping that uh, uh, President uh, Trump would not get another term. Uh, it seems that they are getting this uh, wish. Um, and that means basically uh, they are spared another four years of either agony or surrender, one of the two things. And, you know, it's it's very tough for Iran. But I would not believe that uh, Iran is going to uh, go easy um, with, with the uh, Biden administration. Uh, 
Um, the hardliners are emboldened now more than ever, uh, including the, um, the, the Supreme Leader himself um, and, and uh, the exit of the United States from the, uh, the deal uh, has given uh, the hardliners uh, they, uh, all the evidence they need to show the domestic audience and probably even beyond their borders that uh, uh, deals don't mean anything um, if, if partners don't want to uh, honor them. Uh, and, and, you know, deep down, they don't want to say we don't want to make a deal, but clearly uh, they have the pretext at least uh, to go tough. Um, so uh, I believe for a while they will push for the United States to return to the deal as is, uh, without conditions. Um, and this is very hard, of course, uh, for, for two reasons. One of them is that the deal uh, has, I mean, we already wasted four years of re reaping any benefits from from the deal itself. And it is, it's time to expire on certain provisions of it, our opponents are looming. So the deal itself is not going to serve for the future uh, or long future. Uh, the um, the other issue here is that uh, there will be um, uh, the Biden administration. Um, I don't believe that the Biden administration would just jump on the deal right away because that will give its opponents all the ammunition they need to attack them as being weak on Iran and all of that. And I believe that um, um, we will we will see a, a um, resistance uh, from both sides. Uh, uh, the, the United States and Iran. So that's that. I believe that the Iranians will continue their policy of uh, working through the corridor, uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, and, and establishing their regional um, interest and, and influence. Um, the uh, the, the uh, relation with Saudi Arabia and with the rest of the Gulf uh, it is it is going Iran's way right now because the division of the GCC has been one of the best things that happened to uh, to the Iranians, and I believe that it should be the the the, the, um, the a priority for the Biden administration to try to repair uh, these uh, the, these relations among the three GCCs right now, or maybe even four GCCs. There is Qatar on one side, there is Bahrain, Saudi, and, and UAE, and there is either Kuwait and Oman or Kuwait and Oman. So it's two entities. But clearly, uh, this is a, a bad situation for, for the other side of the Gulf. Iran is enjoying it. Uh, because of it, of course, you have good relations uh, that are established within the GCC uh, when, uh, to, to Iran. And there are uh, even uh, this unified front uh, that used to be there is no longer. So uh, that's what we expect. I believe that Iran's uh, influence inside Iraq will continue to increase uh, right now and, and, and in the near future. Um, and there are, there are uh, you know, again, it's, it depends on how crafty and resourceful and creative the Biden administration will be to uh, give the Iranians an incentive to uh, to go back uh, to to where the, the Obama administration was going on the same trajectory, but without giving in to all Iran's uh, demands. Iran should not feel or even be a triumphant uh, with this change in the U.S. administrations. It should be um, seen as a responsibility for Iran to get its act together and avoid um, a, um, a lost opportunity. And they lost already too many opportunities to, um, uh, to end the, the, uh, the problem that Iran has been posing in the, um, well, for about 40 years now. Fascinating. General Zinni, uh, there were, in, uh, Dr. Khan, uh came up with a lot of what Iran should do. Uh, Along the same lines, what is Iran likely to do? How do you think Iran's worldview affects uh, what they should do? Uh, and, uh, and actually, and within that, uh, how does the regime see itself surviving? Well, I, th I think, uh, you know, one would hope that Iran sees this as an opportunity. 
uh, to maybe change the the dialogue and 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 change the uh, the atmosphere in the region, uh, and and to begin to approach uh, a Biden administration uh, openly with some sort of willingness to look at you know what's in it for them if they were to. Uh, you know, become more cooperative with others in the region, less aggressive in their support for uh, the things that destabilize the region. Uh, it could be a, a, an opportunity. Given the regime in in uh, Iran, it may be hard to see that right now. Uh, it's hard to look for the right moderates in there that might that might be willing to uh, approach this. Uh, I think that you certainly would probably see from a Biden side a willingness to open that kind of dialogue. It's going to be, they're going to feel, since obviously many of them were part of the Obama administration, that their fingers were burned on the last deal because nothing went beyond the deal. In other words, although they were complying with the nuclear deal, they certainly were up to other things that uh, allowed for even domestic criticism of the deal back here and eventually what killed it. So there's going to be a lot of caution from the Biden administration, but I think an openness to hear where Iran wants to take this relationship. I would also say, because I think this was brought out very effectively by uh, our other speakers here, there's a, the relationships from one side of the Gulf to the other have changed a bit in, in more recent times. Uh, there's certain members of the Gulf Cooperation Council that certainly have lines into Iran, uh, and they may be of some sort of assistance in uh, working with Iran and helping look at what kinds of incentives may be out there for them to moderate their, their actions too. So, you know, I've become more convinced that the relationship with Iran is going to be probably a priority issue. And I certainly realize there are many others out there uh, that can affect this region. It's, it's very uh, prone to being destabilized on a moment's notice. Uh, but I think that may be the, the big one that will have to be resolved uh, uh, in some fashion, or at least it will be worked on. I would say one other thing. Uh, we know, as, as, as I think Donia pointed out, the Biden administration is going to have a lot on its plate. Uh, our relationships with China, the domestic issues we have, uh, COVID-19, the economy, everything else. But we have to remember that I think people in the region are going to look very closely at Biden's foreign policy team, because obviously they work these issues. There will be others that will work those other issues. Uh, you know, any U.S. administration has to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. So the makeup of that foreign policy team, Secretary of State, National Security uh, Advisor, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense, and those that are in policy positions beneath them are going to say a lot to the region about which way we're going and uh, how we might engage. So that's something they will watch very closely. Dr. Thoffer, all this we've talked about uh, how Iran will respond, might not respond to uh uh, to an opening to reinstall, reinstate the JCPOA. As we've said many times earlier, there is not a single unified Gulf Arab uh, view uh, perception of Iran and the future. Uh, assuming that there some progress is made towards uh, restarting the JCPOA or a, or a dialogue begins between the United States and Iran, uh, what sort of reaction should we expect from the Gulf states uh, either, just what sort of reaction should we expect from the Gulf states? Well, I, I think they've already begun uh, their responses. I think the UAE and Bahrain's normalization can partly be viewed as a preliminary response to a negotiated JCPOA. Um, the UAE has been really undergoing the normalization process with Israel from as far back as 2015. And I remember, you know, because I, I was around the, uh, the National Defense University and we, we had close dealings with the UAE at the time. And the discussion started to shift uh, about their view of Israel and the Palestinian issue. 
Um, uh, on top of that, uh, if you stand uh, and listen closely to the academic circles back then, there were many surveys going on to the uh, 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 soliciting what the public opinion is about Israel, especially the youth. Have they changed their opinion? So I think this has been going on for a while, since uh, 2015. Um, Qatar and Oman, uh, I think, will remain uh, very flexible. And as General Zini rightly pointed out, um, uh, they will likely offer uh, uh, mediation efforts between the U.S. and Iran. Um, and so I think that's one, one and, and I think actually Oman will come to the lime, limelight more so than it did under the Trump administration. And I think Oman is probably pleased to see that uh, Biden has won uh, because they were kind of in the back burner um, in, this, uh, in, the, in, in this administration, the Trump administration. Um, I said, I might be wrong, but uh, the signals I'm reading from Riyadh is that normalization with Israel is a strong uh, possibility for Saudi Arabia, especially if Mohammed bin Salman takes the throne. Uh, they've been flirting with the idea the rhetoric of Mohammed bin Salman early on uh, during his public appearances, you, you saw the how we should make peace or shut up kind of articles that were released uh, a couple of years ago. Also, um, the statements of uh, Prince Bandar bin Sultan that indicates that Saudi will consider its strategic interests above everything. They do sympathize with the Palestinian cause, but strategic interests are very important. This really uh, is reminiscent of the UAE pre-normalization days. So you might, I, I don't know, there's a good chance it could happen. But I don't think it's going to happen um, in the next 100 days or so. I want to make um, uh, a cru crucial point, um, mm -hmm. is, is and, and I think General Zinni pushed on this one, that the U.S. should really include re regional partners in the JCPA negotiation. I think that would really um, assist in mitigating some of the tensions in the region. And if that's one of the US policy goals in the region, then I, I think that would be important. Although I think it would make the negotiation a little bit tougher because the GCC states are gonna push on regional ambitions of Iran and whatnot, and Iran may not be very pleased uh, to see that. Um, so those are kind of my perspectives. I must say, in the course of my entire career uh, in the Middle East, and particularly in the Gulf, uh, the JCPOA was only the last example of the United States proceeding uh, without consulting with its allies. Virtually every consultation that I ever participated in over the 30-odd uh, years that I, uh, that I was in the region uh, would be that the United States would... Uh, uh, decide what it wants to do, and then hold hold consultations. And in almost every case, the consultation is: "This is what I've decided to do. Uh, let's go along with it." So I, you, you wonder if we can just get out of that habit sometimes. Uh, and I think this is where uh, probably Iraq sees that because Iraq's a different sort of country. So uh, does Iraq take American advice? To, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Iraq has a lot of its own problems. Would it take American advice with regard to the JCPOA and other uh, uh, and other issues involving its relationship with Iran? Dr. Khanem? You got on, I have to. You're muted. You're muted. Okay, great. Um, yeah, uh, Iraq was supportive of the Iran deal, and we know that even they hosted part of the negotiations uh, when uh, they, uh, there was a run-up for, for concluding the deal. They do like nothing more than having the United States and uh, Iran reconcile their differences, because that reflects directly uh, in a positive way on Iraq. Um, so um, I don't believe that the United States need, needs to do a lot of convincing in Iraq when it comes to uh, negotiating with Iran, reaching any conclusions or any any deals. Um, that is uh, that is welcomed in Iraq. In fact, encouraged. And the Iraqis 
in their own way, they said uh, that they were ready to facilitate any talks. They even uh, signaled uh, and, and said, in fact, emphatically that they were willing to act as mediators between Iran and the Arab states because now they have that, that good relations. Uh, anything and uh, any uh, calming on, on the tensions in the region, it uh, fits directly in Iraq's interest. So um, this is the one ally that the United States needs not to worry about uh, when they negotiate with the Iranians. The more negotiation, the, the happier the Iraqis are. Uh, there is uh, also, um, I, I want to mention, in addition to what uh, General Zinni and Dr. Um, uh, Daffer just mentioned, uh, there are two elections to watch in the region, the Iranian election, and also there is a possible Iraqi election uh, that will happen in 2021 as an early election or the regularly scheduled election in 2022. And these are going to be changing uh, the, the, the political scene in two key countries in the region during the, Obama, the, uh, sorry, the, the Biden administration's term. And uh, these are things to watch for because both of them could be game changers in, team, in terms of who gets to be brought by the electorate to, uh, to, to rule these two countries. Uh, Iran is probably, there is a continuity with the supreme leaders, but even that we don't know. I um, uh, always mention that uh, the supreme leader is, well, he's 80, he's ill, and he probably will be departing the scene. But definitely um, these, these two elections are to be put into the calculation. Uh, more than the continuity in the in the Gulf states, where you know, the the pretty much we are having similar uh, uh, government and and political system. Uh, yes, there might be a, a big change if Mohammed bin Salman uh, takes the throne uh, in 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 the future. Uh, but other states, I mean, we saw the transition in Kuwait after the death of the late, late Emir not eventful change uh, they also in Oman when we had recently the death of uh, Sultan Qaboos and these are two key countries in the region in terms of, of the role of their leadership and, and how important they are um, but I think with Saudi it's going to be different if there is a change because uh, the, the Saudi royal family is not on the same page on what the interests are as in Saud and Kuwait and in, in Oman. So uh, yeah, there is there is a lot of that, I think. But uh, back again to the deal, I believe the Iraqis will be will be happy if uh, if diplomacy uh, takes lead again. Uh, thank you. Uh, staying on the subject of Iraq, Iraq we should remember is the one country in the Gulf that is intimately engaged with the rest of the Arab world. It has fought wars. It is the only country in the Gulf that has directly become involved in a war uh, with Israel. It is the only country in the Gulf that uh, has had armed clashes with, uh, fought a war with Iran. Uh, it uh, has had real differences with uh, Syria and with Turkey. We now see a complete uh, uh, overhaul of relationships in the area. Russia is becoming more active. General Zinni, where do you see the rest of the Arab world impacting on Iraq and on the uh, Gulf region in general right now, or events in the rest of the Arab world and in Turkey? Yeah, well, I, I, I think the, one of the curses for the region is too much interest from outside. Uh, I okay. think what we're beginning to see, obviously, is Turkey may have shifted away from uh, Europe, uh, probably in frustration in their attempts to join the European Union and uh, you know, really strain the NATO relationship uh, and maybe see their future is better in uh, Central Asia and, uh, and in uh, the, the Middle East and the Gulf region. Uh, and, and of course, uh, we saw what happened with the Russians coming in uh, to Syria. Uh, Chinese have a uh, different approach, not, not so much in terms of military, although uh, there's been a little bit of that, but they've shown great interest in as a terminal for their Belt and Road uh, efforts. And so uh, one of the things that always concerned me is all this diverse outside interest and 
uh, projection into the region made it very difficult for the region to to resolve its own issues or to create some sort of cooperative, cohesive regional approach uh, to the issues. And unfortunately, I think that's going to continue in many ways. Uh, Iraq is a good example of that because it is emerging now. Uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, I think, uh, as Abbas pointed out, it has a, an election, which I think is going to be significant coming up next year. Uh, it's trying to hold itself together. It, it, it obviously has uh, internal issues that it has to deal with and and, and bringing together Sunni, Shia, Kurd, Chaldean, and Assyrian Christian, it's quite a mixed bag in there. And a lot of work has to be done to heal some things that went on before that uh, exacerbated those internal relationships. It probably needs some space and time and support to get those things done more than it needs intervention uh, in telling it how to do its business coming up. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I think this is a region that probably needs some breathing space, but isn't going to get it for external and internal uh, uh, reasons coming up. I think here the United States may play a, an important role in trying to assist in this, uh, because we are one of the outside influencers in all this too. But the more we can do to lessen tensions, the more that we could do to broker maybe agreements and and, and and somehow help resolve things like the Qatar issue and you know, what's going on in Israel now. I, I do think that the uh, uh, the recognition of Israel was done specifically because America's role as a broker that said the final status issues will be resolved through negotiations was taken off the table by Trump. We basically said there are no final status issues. Jerusalem's the capital. There is no right of return. The borders are whatever... Uh, Netanyahu wants to make them. Uh, and I think the, the, rec the recognition of Israel may have been a measure to stop some of that and at least gain some leverage uh, to prevent, say, further expansion of settlements uh, uh, uncontained in, in any way. Uh, and, 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 and was a good measure and a, and a good step from that perspective. But I think all of this needs to be somehow brought to the different tables that we need for discussions of disputes and outside interests and lessening tensions and looking at how support for the region is, is constructed, how military cooperation is done. But there's so many issues, external and internal. And again, it may be a great opportunity, but it is going to be very complicated in the long run. Thank you. Speaking of intractable issues, uh, it has now been three years and counting since uh, the quartet uh, broke relations with Qatar. And uh, we just heard that there is some talk among experts that somehow uh, President Trump would like to pull the rabbit out of the hat uh, and settle this issue. Uh, if he settles the issue, then my next question is moot. Uh, in, the, in the more likely uh, circumstance that he won't settle, the Qatar dispute with its neighbors. Uh, do you really think that we care? I mean, is it really that important or have we just worked our way through it? Uh, Dr. Dhafer. Yes, okay. So I, definitely I think it would be great to have that rabbit pulled out of the hat. Um, I think having a united front in the GCC is, is, is an issue that I, I believe has been overlooked. Um, it really goes back to the question of establishing a regional order um, in the absence of capable institutions of regulating uh, interactions among the, the Gulf countries, you can expect um, more conflict to ensue. Uh, in the current context, um, none of the GCC states have the leverage to get the other one to submit to their will while their strategic interests diverge to the extent that there will likely uh, be continued tensions among them. So that's kind of a dilemma. And I think um, a failure uh, in the US policy, in my opinion, is the fixation on bilateral relations without enough emphasis, I believe, on multilateral relations. In regards to the Gulf, the GCC is one institution that can be uh, valuable uh, for U.S. interests. Um, and 
I think it, uh, General Zinni, he, he discussed the elusive quest of establishing the Arab NATO or MISA, which was another missed opportunity for regional cooperation and for US interests, to be frank. Um, the, you know, Washington has strong ties with all of the GCC states, and the rift between them is really a threat uh, to the containment of Iran. Also, tensions have uh, been escalated uh, with an ambitious Turkey um, steadily expanding its interest in the Gulf and throughout the Middle East. Um, and, you know, Turkey was now welcomed into the Gulf with, with, with open arms. Um, additionally, regional conflicts uh, are, when you look at regional conflicts in the region, they're intertwined within the GCC division. And the, the Gulf Rift has really become embedded into the broader Middle East crisis and has deepened regional fault lines. I look at the Libyan conflict, Syria, Yemen. I mean, these are all prime examples. Therefore, I think uh, resolving the Gulf crisis is a linchpin to addressing conflict in the Middle East. And I, I do think that a, a Biden administration should offer more priority to that. Uh, we still don't know what he's going to do. I imagine he's going to pursue diplomacy and resolving the conflict. I know he hasn't talked about it much during his uh, campaigning, but we all know that probably most Americans are not really concerned <laughs> with the United GCC, so that's probably the reason why he didn't mention it. Thank you. Uh, uh, General Zinni, you were in charge of the last effort by the United States government to bring this all to a happy conclusion. Uh, are you a betting man? What uh, is what are the odds that Trump can actually do something between now and the end of the year, and what would it take? Well, let me tell you, I think it's first important to understand what this dispute is about. First of all, it's not, despite what you would hear in the region, it's not just about the 13 demands that are on the table. It's not just about Al Jazeera and, and all this other stuff. You know, uh, There is some deep-rooted historic uh, animosity that is... At, at the base of a lot of this. Uh, having said that, uh, in my mind, this all could be resolved very quickly. If there was a coming to the table unconditionally, and I think only the U.S. president can probably push that issue, uh, I think it could be resolved. It may be a, a, a need to put some incentives on the table, it may need, be a need to get some understanding about certain issues that do rub each of the parties the wrong way. Uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed that it's gone on this long. And one of the reasons it's gone on this long is, frankly, because we didn't push at the highest levels to get this resolved. Fine to send me out. Uh, but, you know, the first question I get is are you speaking for the president? Is the president going to push this? Is there going to demand everybody come to Camp David and sit down at the table and get this resolved and bang on the table? Uh, absent that, they're going to push this as long as they can. I think one part of the effort of the quartet is to see how much pain they could inflict on Qatar. Uh, Qatar managed to get by, you know, so that kind of has gone by the wayside. Uh, I will tell you that it's up to probably Saudi Arabia and UAE, the leadership in those two countries. Bahrain is along for the ride. I would say the Egyptians are in this because of one issue, and that's the Muslim Brotherhood, and probably are pushed into this because of the sort support they get from Saudi Arabia and UAE. So they want to be on that side. Uh, like I said, if 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 the president pushed on this, and it would probably take personal involvement to some level it could be resolved fairly quickly. I don't think the issues, as they're stated, are that great that they can't be overcome. Thank you. Uh, there has been one conflict going on in the region. It's been going on now for a number of years, uh, and it is perhaps one of the greatest human tragedies on the face of the earth uh, so far. And no one's talking about it very much. Yemenis are dying by the thousands of starvation, of dysentery, and getting killed. Uh, uh, we uh, early on we uh, we talked a bit about 
what tools would be available to uh, uh, to President Biden to bring the war to a halt. Uh, uh, starting with uh, perhaps uh, General Zinni, uh, would there be an interest? Can we bring the war to a halt? Uh, you know, how could we bring the uh, war to the halt? Uh, the war to a halt, and why would we? Aside from the humanitarian considerations, which haven't always bothered us in the past. Well, I, I, first of all, I think the humanitarian, as has been mentioned before by Dania and others, this is catastrophic. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we haven't shown the degree of involvement that could possibly push the peace talks further. Uh, the UN, uh, under Martin Griffith, has tried mightily to get the two sides to the table. I think going back to what we talked about with Iran, uh, that could be one of the things that we bring to the table too, to uh, in, in a, any kind of uh, improved relationship with Iran, to begin a dialogue on Yemen, uh, and and of course I think we can bring that sort of pressure on Saudi Arabia. I mean the UAE is already withdrawn from the war; it's not very popular uh, on the streets. Uh, it is creating. Uh, uh, a greater division in our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Frankly, I think there are many people in the region that want to find a way out of this. Uh, it's going to take cooperation with Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United States, the UAE, and I think the Houthis and others on the ground to make this work. But we ought to push behind the UN effort and support the mediation process here to try to get everybody to the table and also help provide more of the humanitarian aid that's necessary before this thing truly becomes a, 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 a disaster of monumental proportions. Uh, turning to uh, some questions, uh, we have about 15 minutes left in the session. Uh, some questions from the audience, some particularly interesting ones. In particular, one very large question, hang, question hanging out there, which we have not addressed uh, very much at all. What pushed the, the UAE and later Bahrain uh, to seek the normalization uh, with, Iraq, with uh, Israel? Was it an American initiative? Was it a, uh, an initiative uh, that originated with the Emirates? Uh, Dr. Dhaffer. Yes, uh, I think it, 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 it originated with, with the Emiratis, in, in my opinion. Uh, uh, they saw what happened under the o Obama administration and they said, you know what, uh, we need to hedge our bets and figure out another solution for how we're going to uh, secure ourselves and our interests in the region. And, you know, I Israel and uh, the UAE definitely uh, align on the issue of Iran and so does Saudi Arabia. Um, also, I think the UAE is a, is a forward looking country. Um, it wants to get its hands on the most advanced technologies, and it saw the opportunity to get uh, a lot of uh, trade of, of, of techni technical know-how and whatnot um, uh, from, from Israel um, with regards to uh, cyber issues, uh, monitoring, intelligence. Um, also, I, I, I believe that... Um, uh, uh, Israel does help uh, any state in Washington, um, and, and you know, Israel. You know, we all know that Israel has a strong uh, lobby, lobbying body here. Um, I think that uh, Israel has kind of given uh, the UAE uh, has mentored the UAE how how to address Washington, and the UAE has been very successful at uh, at that. Um, so, yeah, I think there are a lot of benefits associated with it. Um, I don't think it was just an affair related to Trump, although he wants to take full credit for it. For it. Um, so I think we saw this uh, ongoing. Uh, Bahrain has really been one of the most open countries with Israel, historically. And so I, I think it was not really a surprise that Bahrain normalized relations. And all I, I, although I would note that Saudi uh, probably gave Bahrain the green light to normalize, the UAE has tremendous domestic political uh, influence in Bahrain. It has bought out uh, so many important 
uh, economic uh, uh, issues in, in Bahrain. And even like the business elites have been um, challenged by the UAE in Bahrain. That, that is one, one factor. And even the, the late prime minister who just passed away had a lot of tensions with the UAE because he was very influential in the business community. Um, so, you, you, I mean, I mean, Bahrain. Bahrain um, is undergoing some difficult financial issues. The UAE, when they give aid to any country, they have uh, strings attached to it. So I do think uh, that also had an influence on Bahrain's uh, normalization with Israel. I, that's uh, it's very interesting. The uh, the idea that this was more of a UAE initiative uh, makes sense in many ways. Uh, General Zinni, on the same subject, you know, what prompted the UAE? And then suddenly at the end of the discussion, we have the Abraham Accords. And yesterday, I believe, or two days ago, the administration made the formal notification on the F-35 to be sold to the, uh, to the UAE, made the formal notification to Congress. Uh, do you think this was, this was truly a quid pro quo, something that was added in at the end, uh, that the Israelis like this idea? Uh, there's certainly been some noises floated by the uh, uh, transition team as it came together that they're not terribly happy uh, with this sale. General Zenni? Uh, well, I, first of all, I completely agree with Dania that this was a UAE initiative. Uh, I think for several reasons. One, uh, it, it improved an already great relationship they have with the United States. Uh, it also as I said before, gained them some leverage on Israel. I mean, Israel was now unchecked, uh, given Trump's uh, recognition of Jerusalem and basically given the green light to Netanyahu on, on settlements. Uh, so now with recognition from two states, uh, this, uh, this means that, uh, that there's something at risk should Netanyahu try to you know, acquire more uh, settlements or, 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 or do something that uh, further impacts the Palestinians. Also, it gave them leverage to ask for the quality F-35s. Now, remember one thing, and I'll speak only from a military perspective now. UAE's been one of our closest allies. It has been with us in Somalia when we asked, in the first Gulf War when we asked. They were there in Afghanistan when we were there. They're there with us in Syria. They have a very competent military. I mean, they, they get called the little Sparta, you know, in, in terms of their military capability and their ability to handle uh, the technology. So there is a military uh, sort of positive uh, re uh, understanding as to why you might want to give an ally that's that strong and shows up uh, the kind of capabilities it has. So that moment allowed them to capitalize on this also. Also realize the UAE has done a great deal to move forward on secularization, the role of women, and other things that we have promoted beyond just security interest in, in the Gulf and would like to see elsewhere in, in the Middle East. I think in the case of Bahrain, they would never have done it without the Saudis okay. And I would also go as far as to perhaps the Saudis encourage them to do it as sort of a stalking horse before they might recognize it. And I think that was to gain maybe a reaction from their, their own populations to see how it would go and how it would play out. Uh, so going back to something Dania said, maybe not in the first 100 days, but you might be see, seeing Saudi now having agreed, you know, okay, sort of the UAE, but definitely Bahrain to do this, that they're lining up uh, to do the same thing too. Thank you. Uh, a question that was raised briefly uh, earlier by Dr. Kardam, which I think is important. Uh, China. China is the world's other major power. It is probably the only real peer competitor we have in economic terms, and it is close to being the only peer competitor we have in military strategic terms. Uh, we, uh, just by way of introduction to the question, uh, uh, last year, the uh, forum had the good fortune of uh, taking part in uh, several events with the uh, University of Peking, uh, which has a center for Gulf Studies. 
And the Chinese concern that we heard at the time was a desire not to get caught up in the same sort of Cold War that the West, the United States had with the Soviet Union all those years, that they would like to work out some sort of modus vivendi. It's not coming home in the Gulf. As we noted earlier, China has expressed an interest in pursuing the construction of a Lafau port, uh, which a South Korean company had abandoned. Will the U.S. respond? How, what is the U.S.'s view of what the Chinese are doing in Iraq? Is this positive? Is it building stability in the region? Or is it a foothold by an adversary that we would like to prevent from taking place? Um, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Thaffer first. Yes. Well, I, I do think uh, for some of the state ports are very important, especially the UAE. The UAE has really been the place itself uh, strategically. Um, gain, uh, um, gain, uh, sorry, there's a clicking noise, I think, if uh, everyone needs their microphone. Um, it gain. Uh, the Chinese are trying to gain a strategic uh, foothold uh, with regards to ports and so is the UAE. I think if, if the U.S. were to try to engage on that kind of um, uh, divergence, uh, uh, like uh, uh, press on uh, Chinese interests on ports and how that diverges from UAE's interests in, in ports, it could kind of have uh, and assist the UAE in this process while securing U.S. interest, it, it would kind of help uh, the U.S.'s overall strategic goals with countering Chinese influence in the, the Gulf. And I think the, the, the GCC's relations primarily with China is com uh, are, are commercial. And uh, so I think the U.S. needs to be more strategic about dealing with these commercial issues. I know that... Um, oil relations have really shifted uh, to the east and Chinese are investing um, uh, ver uh, vertically in the um, hydrocarbon industry. I think the U.S. still needs to make sure that it maintains investments in that, although, it's, although the U.S. does produce oil at home, it's still beneficial for U.S. companies and it still keeps U.S. ahead of China in, in the GCC. Dr. Uh, General Zinni, uh, do you see uh, the Chinese offer to uh, build a foul port uh, as a strategic challenge to the United States, something that might help U.S. interests in the region? I, I think it might be uh, an economic challenge. I, I completely agree with Dania that we get we are way behind the power curve on uh, understanding uh, commercial interests in the region and how to promote them. That's never been something we've done well, and the Chinese are mastering exceptionally well. If you think about this, the security of the Gulf region is more important to maybe the rest of the world than the United States from practical terms like energy and economics. Uh, but it's in our interest since we have a globalized economy and uh, that, 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 that it is protected. But who's protected it? I mean, basically, since the Brits left in the 1970s, we have assumed uh, the, the security role in, in the Gulf. Uh, we haven't always done it well. We haven't always done it you know, with the best uh, strategic uh, design possible in doing it. Uh, the Chinese had, have had an advantage in this in that there's not a Chinese soldier there on the ground. You know, and yet their interests have been protected. And they've been able to understand how to project power globally without doing it through military force. They do it through economic and commercial strength. That, and, and going back to Dania's point again, we have never really mastered that. Our, our strong point in terms of uh, global influence has been militarily primarily. And that is a mistake. I think all of us that have served in government, whether it's in military uniform or in, in a, in a three-piece suit in the State Department, agree that we need to have a balanced approach to the world. Diplomatic, uh, economic, uh, cultural, we need a balanced approach in terms of influence. And we've been too one-sided on the military. And the Chinese are 
figuring out how to do it without investing in a globalized military projected all over the world. And this is an example of it, and it will challenge our influence there. I would say one thing. There was a prime minister in the region, and I won't name him. Everybody will know him right away, that when I first took over at CENTCOM, he said to me, the image of an American in this part of the world is a soldier in full combat gear. The image of, a, of someone like from China is a businessman. It's someone that has commercial interests, that wants to talk about the economy. And he said, you need to change that image. And I, I think that was good advice. Dr. Cottom, uh, since it's your country and your port, El Fao, uh, where does, uh, I mean, does, does Iraq welcome Chinese investment or just any investment at all? Or how would you see this? Well, Al Fao has become a political and geopolitical question. There is this competition with Kuwait. Uh, Kuwait built a, uh, a port, and the Iraqis want to build their own port. And the question is, all of these ports, how is it going to be utilized? And then, of course, uh, the, um, the this is one part of it. The other part is uh, the issue of money. Uh, the Iraqis don't have the cash to build anything, so they need to have investment rather than any any other way. Uh, but but Chinese and Iraq are more than just Al Fao. There is a uh, during the last days of um, um, Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi's government, he went in September uh, 2019 to China and announced a 500 billion dollar deal and something that appealed to their some Iraqis at least. Uh, the called. Uh, oil for reconstruction. Now, Iraqis had oil for food, oil for corruption, but it was a nice change that you would have oil for reconstruction. One thing about the Chinese that make them appeal to the Iraqis is that it is not complicated with China. The Chinese come to the table with the government official, the company that does the work, and the bank that will give the money. All of them belong to the same entity, and they sign together on the dotted lines. With the U.S., good luck trying to do that. So, uh, also the Chinese are well known to have done work fast and done that. Iraq is depleted. Uh, the U.S. for a number of years, from 2003 all the way to 2011, uh, did not leave it any record or anything on the ground of any reconstruction. Uh, they did a lot of uh, combating terrorism, security issues. They um, but they did not build anything uh, other than some works on the uh, uh, the oil industry and in a limited way, the electricity and both of these. You know, the oil is fine because 93 percent of Iraqi budget is dependent on oil. So the Iraqis take care of that. But the, 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 the electricity is uh, is a failure, to be honest. And there is nothing else. So the Iraqis say maybe if we bring uh, people like the Chinese or others, uh, the other problem is that the Chinese will send their own companies. Uh, Western uh, countries, normally when they go there, they take the contract and give it to a subcontractor who's an Iraqi. And that's why we had projects that were done four times on paper and nothing on the ground uh, because it was all the money was stolen once, twice, three times um, because the U.S. is nothing more or companies or even some Western companies because of security issues, they are just contractors who are best at getting the contract but not doing the work they just give it to a subcontractor the the third part i think with the chinese that that give them a little a bit of a head start well a big head start is that they don't have problems with kickbacks and other things uh, western corporations normally there are laws that govern them and they could go to jail if they give bribes etc that's why you see um, there is some part of that. Uh, the Chinese-Iraqi uh, um, agreement has been uh, politicized during Adil Abdel Mahdi's government time. Then after the protest, it was halted. Now under the Qadimi government, they just are saying that it is on. They have never canceled it and it is going to go forward, uh, including not just al Fao, but also there is a talk about a full-scale reconstruction. Iraqi reconstruction bill uh, from ISIS and non-ISIS related go goes up to $150 billion, and the Chinese would love to be part of that um, in, in that sense. 
Uh, I don't know. We did build something. We spent uh, $3 billion, I think, building the biggest embassy that's ever been built any place. That I forgot. <laughs> I we've come to the end of our time. This has been a wonderful uh, uh, discussion. I hope our audience has, uh, I'm sure our audience has enjoyed it, learned something from it. I'm going to go around uh, the table one last time. If you could say, take a minute or so to say, what's the most important thing that you expect to happen, good or bad, in 2021, in the first year of the Biden administration? General Zinni. Well, I, like I said before, I, I think uh, although it's a very complicated and confused environment, uh, that lends itself to opportunity. Uh, I think if we're constructive, we think strategically uh, about the region, we build partnerships out there, there could be opportunities for us to change the dynamics in the region or contribute to it. Uh, Dr. Daffer. Well, uh, the three big issues that are on my mind is, uh, I think having uh, an agreement with Iran would, would help the region overall and uh, assist with the conflict. And I, that's probably a very obvious answer. Um, the Yemen war, I wish uh, that would, that's probably, I guess, personally one that I sympathize with a lot and um, really hope to see a solution from Biden since he promised uh, that at least he would stop U.S. support for the war. And, um, and as I mentioned, why I think resolving the GCC rift is really important because it, 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 I think it would have a domino effect of, and, and, and other areas of conflict throughout the region. Dr. Kadem. Uh, I'm a historian, so I don't do predictions. I <laughs> like to look at things that are very sure. You know what happened when you talk about it. But if I have to, uh, I, I agree with, with both uh, excellent uh, predictions that were made um, uh, by, by Dr. Um, Laffer and, and by um, uh, General Zinni. But I believe that uh, we will have a, uh, a better uh, relations between Iraq and, and the United States. And I think uh, this is something that, that has to happen uh, if we were to um, to, to um, get the region stabilized, uh, Iraq is very important for the U.S. And I believe that the Iraqi-American strategic dialogue uh, will will take off uh, on a better uh, trajectory. Well, thank you all very much. This has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Charchari uh, for uh, all that the University of Michigan has done. Uh, uh, talking about the last question to the University of Michigan, uh, the other thing that you might be able to insert into your curriculum there is how do we uh, change American foreign policy so it is done by diplomats rather than soldiers? And now I just uh, close off. Thank you all very much. Dr. Charchari. Thank you. Well, that's a good advertisement for our Wiser Diplomacy Center. And of course, uh, we're very grateful to all of you for sharing your insights here on a dynamic region of enduring importance to the U.S. and therefore also the new administration. Dr. Daffer, Dr. Khadim, uh, General Zinni, Ambassador Theros, thank you so much uh, for your contributions today. Uh, audience, thank you for participating. Stay tuned. We have another panel uh, of experts coming up after the Thanksgiving break from the American Academy of Diplomacy, also looking at what's next for U.S. foreign policy. And so we appreciate your time. Have a wonderful night. Thank you very much. Thank you, and have a good night. Stay safe.